Okay, according to my clock, it's 530. So I believe we'll go get go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is David Morris, and I am chair of the UAB Department of Physical Therapy. And I'd like to welcome you uh, to our eighth annual Maryland Gospin Lecture for the Advancement of Physical Therapy. Uh, I was thinking just earlier today that the last time we had this lecture was about a year ago. It was held live and it was the last live event that we held here in the department. Uh, it's been quite a year for everyone, quite challenging. And I hope that each and every one of you are safe, healthy and seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, there are some benefits to doing this virtually. We do expect that this is getting a much greater reach, uh, getting out to many more people. So that's a, a very positive thing. And tonight we are using the UAB Zoom platform, which has uh, some added bells and whistles. <clears throat> My camera will be the only one that will be visible until after the lecture. Uh, and uh, during the, the lecture and any time that, that we're on tonight, uh, if you have any questions or any comments, you're, you should feel free to type them in the chat box or in the Q&A section, and they'll be read uh, at a later time. So before we move into our lecture tonight, uh, there are a couple of things that I need to do. I first of all need to recognize some of my colleagues here, and then we need to present an award. So we're going to start out with uh, Dr. Andrew Butler, who is the Dean of the UAB School of Health Professions. Uh, Dr. Butler is a physical therapist and, and we claim him in our department as one of our own. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Christie is the DPT program director. Dr. Tara Pierce is director of clinical education. Dr. John Lohman is director of residency education. Dr. Rob Model is director of research. Dr. Don Lyon is Director of Continuing Education and Community Outreach. Dr. Bill Reed is the Interim Program Director for our PhD in Rehabilitation Science Program. And Dr. Christopher Hurt is Interim Co-Program Director of the PhD in Rehabilitation Science Program. <clears throat> Dr. William Brooks is actually on faculty in the School of uh, Medicine, but he teaches anatomy to our DPT students and we like to claim him as our own as well. Dr. Kara Bullard, Dr. Carmen Capalugo, Dr. Matthew Itheburn, Dr. Ashley Parrish, Dr. Patty Perez, Dr. Harshvarden Singh, and Dr. Sherry York. We also have uh, several adjunct faculty. Uh, many of you remember Dr. Diane Clark before she retired as our program director and she's now emeritus faculty and still teaches in the classroom. We have Dr. Jennifer Green Wilson who teaches uh, pro professional uh, personal leadership content throughout the curriculum and Dr. Liz Wiley who teaches neurologic physical therapy content for us. So I'm very proud to uh, recognize all of these colleagues and uh, we're very proud to have them on our faculty. So the first thing that we're going to do tonight is we're going to present an award. It's the Joan Bergman Pioneer in Alabama Physical Therapy Award. Uh, this award was established in honor of Dr. Bergman. Dr. Bergman, as many of you know, was one of the first physical therapists in Alabama and the first uh, physical therapist at UAB. Uh, in 1964, Dr. Bergman was asked to launch a physical therapy educational program here at UAB, and she did so. That's uh, who we are today. In addition to being a pioneer in physical therapy education, uh, Dr. Bergman earned international prominence in her work with assistive technology for individuals with disabilities. Joan is still uh, a valued advisor for all of us and a very enthusiastic supporter of our program. So several years ago, we established this award in her honor. Since that time, we've uh, presented this award three times, first to her in 2018 to Joe Clellan 
and 2020 to Kara Adams. This year's recipient is Betty Denton. Uh, Betty uh, received a bachelor's in physical therapy here at UAB in 1969. So uh, according to my calculations, she was in the third graduating class. She also earned an MA in education from UAB in 1973. She engaged in several clinical posts in the Birmingham area and then joined the UAB PT faculty in 1983. She served in the role as academic coordinator of clinical education until 1991. And then at that time, she stepped in the role of coordinator of curriculum development and evaluation. In this role, she led the program through a number of curricular transitions, including the transition of our master's program to our doctor of physical therapy degree program. Uh, this is a, a personal thing for me because Betty was a very valued mentor of mine. Uh, she was the chair of my uh, master's thesis committee. And uh, I'll never forget uh, in 1991, when I received a phone call from her over in the clinic at Spain Rehab, where I was working, where she invited me to lunch. I learned during that lunch that uh, Marilyn Gossman had sent her to recruit me into a faculty position, actually stepping in to her role as academic coordinator of clinical education. But Betty, I'm very grateful to you for opening that door for me, as you have for many other a physical therapy faculty member. Uh, we love you and, and we are very grateful for all that you've done for UAB physical therapy as well as physical therapy throughout Alabama. So congratulations to you, Betty. I also want to uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, an endowed professorship that we have within the department, the Bergman Pinkston Endowed Professorship. Uh, I already talked a little bit about uh, Joan, but I'd also like to spend a few moments recognizing uh, Dr. Dorothy Pinkston. Uh, sadly, we lost uh, Dr. Pinkston back in December, uh, but uh, Dr. Pinkston's roots to UAB go way before uh, we, we really launched here uh, when she and her colleagues, Geneva Johnson and Don Limkuhl, started the first post-baccalaureate uh, physical therapy educational program at Case Western Reserve. That is connected to UAB in that several of the early graduates from that program came to UAB, including Marilyn Gossman, Joe Clellan, Kara Adams, and Kara Davis to, to launch our program and to grow our program. So we were very closely connected to the Case Western Reserve a group. Uh, Dr. Pinkston joined the faculty here at UAB in 1975 when that program closed. Uh, and in addition to a very prominent and very uh, successful military career, Dr. Pinkston was very engaged in service to the APTA, served in multiple positions, was recognized with the Lucy Blair Service Award, was named a fellow of the American Physical Therapy Association and was asked to deliver the 1986 Mary McMillan Lecture. Uh, so we were going to miss Dot and we're very grateful for everything that she did for our program and the profession. To honor these two individuals, we endowed a professorship in, in uh, a, a few years back. And I'm happy to announce that we recently named uh, Don Lyon in that position. So Don is now our Bergman Pinkston Endowed Professor, and he will be using this endowment to develop a curriculum uh, for physical therapy uh, for underserved populations. So congratulations, Don, and we're very excited about what all uh, you can bring forward. Now let's move on to talk a little bit about uh, the reason that we're here tonight, the Gossman Lecture. So Marilyn Gossman uh, joined the UAB physical therapy faculty in 1967 and very soon thereafter took over as director. She served in that role for the next 30 years until we lost her way too soon to breast cancer in 1998. Loved by all, Marilyn was a triple th threat. 
She was a legendary educator. She was an accomplished researcher and she was fiercely dedicated to service to the profession. Uh, during her time uh, in the profession, she was a uh, recipient of the Lucy Blair Service Award. She was named uh, Catherine Worthingham Fellow. <clears throat> and there is, uh, continues to be a seminar at Combined Sections Meeting every year in her honor. And the uh, Alabama chapter named their highest award after her, the Marilyn Gossman Award for Professionalism in Physical Therapy. Her visionary spirit lives on through this endowed lectureship that we established in her honor. Uh, this is the eighth time that we've held this lectureship. Uh, and you can see the, the past recipients and the past lecturers of this uh, lecture, uh, not a shabby crowd uh, by any means. <laughs> So it now gives me great pleasure to introduce our lecturer for uh, tonight, uh, Dr. Gregory Hicks. Dr. Hicks is professor in the Department of Physical Therapy uh, and associate VP for clinical and translational research at the University of Delaware. He's also principal investigator and director of the Delaware Clinical and Translational Excel Program. As you'll learn a little bit tonight, he was also the founding director of Advancing Diversity in PT Education Program. And in 2018, he was also named a Catherine Northingham Fellow of the American Physical Therapy Association. Oh, and somewhere along the line too, he served on the APTA's board of directors. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and ask for the lecture to begin and Thank you all again for joining us tonight. I'd like to begin this lecture by thanking the faculty of the University of Alabama at Birmingham's Department of Physical Therapy for the invitation to give the eighth annual Marilyn Gossman Endowed Lecture for the Advancement of Physical Therapy. Unfortunately, I never had the opportunity to meet Dr. Gossman in person, but I don't think it's possible to be a physical therapy researcher and not know the name Marilyn Gossman. And personal anecdotes from people who knew her well and from people who only interacted with her tangentially, I've heard that Dr. Gossman was the type of person who made you feel seen and that you mattered. One of my favorite quotes from the American poet Maya Angelou is, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So I don't think there could be a higher compliment paid than for someone to say that Dr. Gossman made them feel as if they mattered. Clearly she was a special person and her commitment to your department, your institution, to her colleagues, to research and education, all demonstrate her passion for the advancement of the profession of physical therapy. It's an honor for me to give this lecture. You know, whenever I'm asked to give an invited lecture that's really unrelated to my own line of research, I usually spend a fair amount of time just thinking, trying to process what it is I want to say. Even though I try to open my mind up to a wide array of topics, inevitably I end up going back to the one idea that's really sitting at the forefront of my mind during that particular period of time. And in the time since I received the invitation to give this talk until now, the one topic that has remained a constant staple in my mind is the topic of health equity. When you consider the backdrop of this past year, there have been significant unrest in so many aspects of our lives, social unrest, economic unrest, political unrest, and a deep unrest in the realm of healthcare given the global pandemic that we're all experiencing right now. While this type of turmoil can be deeply unsettling and scary, it also brings massive opportunities opportunities to reevaluate, to think deeply, and to make changes that allow us to move forward into a better future for all of us. Now is the time for us as healthcare professionals, as physical therapists, to reevaluate, to think deeply, and to make changes within our profession that prioritize the creation of a healthcare environment where patients of all races, ethnicities, Beliefs and backgrounds can be guaranteed an equitable and just healthcare experience. I've entitled my talk, Plant the Tree Now, because there's an old saying, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago, but the second best time to plant the tree is now. 
while it would have been great to have prioritized health equity within our profession 20 years ago, right now really is the second best time to do it. Our profession should have an explicit commitment to advance equity and justice within the healthcare sector. When this COVID-19 pandemic began, it really sparked my desire to explore the 1918 influenza pandemic in more depth. That 1918 pandemic had a direct influence on my family. My maternal grandmother lost her mother when she was only six months old during the fall of 1918, when the deadliest wave of that pandemic hit the United States. That loss set my grandmother up for an extremely challenging childhood. And it really makes me think about all the children who've lost parents during this pandemic and what they're going to face. According to the CDC, it's estimated that about 500 million people or one third of the world's population became infected with that virus. The number of deaths was estimated to be at least 50 million worldwide and about 675,000 occurring in the United States alone. Given the minimal contact between black Americans and healthcare agencies at that time, we don't have accurate data to say how many black Americans became infected with influenza or died. There's some literature to suggest that blacks were less likely to become infected with the 1918 virus. One of the primary theories is that Jim Crow segregation laws function in the same way that quarantines do today, by slowing community spread. Even though black Americans were less likely to become infected, they were more likely to die if they became infected. According to University of Maryland public health scholar, Marion Moser Jones, not many hospitals accepted black Americans and those that did sent them to the basement for care. Segregation laws would have prevented black people from receiving the best care available at that time. And in the rural South where my grandmother was born and where segregation was in full effect, her mother didn't have access to current best medical care. Rather, she died at home after receiving uninformed and inadequate care from family and community members who were just doing their best. This is an obvious example of how systemic and structural racism in the form of Jim Crow laws led to health equities in our past. The 1918 influenza pandemic ended in 1920. 100 years later, we watched as the COVID-19 pandemic took hold globally. As a country and as healthcare providers, I think it's important for us to ask, do we still see the same type of health inequities during this pandemic? Unfortunately, the answer is yes. Even though obvious forms of structural racism, such as Jim Crow laws have been abolished, we still see privilege within this pandemic. According to the nonpartisan APM Research Lab, age-adjusted death rates due to COVID-19 are not the same for all racial and ethnic groups. According to data available through February 2nd of 2021, Pacific Islander, Latinx, Black, and Indigenous Americans all have a COVID-19 death rate at least double the rate of white and Asian Americans. So why do we see these inequities in mortality rates? In order to understand these health inequities, we have to look at social determinants of health. Social determinants of health are environmental factors that impact the health functioning and quality of life for the individual. The home, the family and environment that you're born into, they establish your initial social determinants of health. And some of these social determinants are not easily overcome. Some important factors to consider are the neighborhood, the social context, economic stability, educational attainment, as well as access to and utilization of healthcare. Without access to high quality education, your future job prospects are limited to lower paying jobs and potential occupational instability. In those lower paying jobs, it's less likely to have paid sick leave and good health insurance coverage. If you can't take time off from work without losing income, you're less likely to access health care, even if you are insured, not to mention other factors that could limit health care access and utilization, such as transportation issues, local access to good health care facilities family care issues, communication barriers, and cultural differences. There's are just a few of the social determinants of health that have differentially impacted the mortality rates due to COVID-19 for various racial and ethnic groups in the United States. It's important to note that these social determinants of health are major factors impacting health inequities, both inside and outside of this pandemic. 
COVID-19 is just placing a spotlight on these issues and hopefully we all have our eyes open to see. In addition to examining the disparities in COVID-19 mortality rates, it's particularly important for us as rehabilitation professionals to consider the morbidity associated with COVID-19 and how disparities may emerge on this front. While we don't have data yet on disparities in post-COVID morbidity, we do have some emerging data focused on symptom presentation in long haulers. Those are individuals who continue to experience prolonged symptoms associated with COVID-19. This prolonged illness is now being referred to as long COVID. In a recent study by Hannah Davis, they characterized long COVID in an international cohort of nearly 4,000 participants who experienced COVID-19. 65% of these patients experienced symptoms for at least six months. The most common symptoms were fatigue, post-exertional malaise, and cognitive dysfunction, all of which need to be considered from a rehabilitation perspective. There are also other symptoms that are highly relevant to rehabilitation, including breathlessness, headache, joint aches and pains, muscle aches, muscle weakness, dizziness, and balance issues. As physical therapists, we know that this melange of symptoms means poor outcomes for the patient. We're talking about the potential for long-term functional limitations, participation restrictions, and reduced quality of life. Now let's consider how this might play out from a health equity perspective, given what we already know from the healthcare literature. In a recent commentary in the New England Journal of Medicine Catalyst, Flash and colleagues stated that even before the pandemic, individuals in vulnerable categories experienced poor access to post-hospitalization services, lower quality care, and in turn, worse rehabilitation outcomes. In fact, Flash and colleagues went on to cite several key studies to consider. First, patients with Medicaid coverage who are disproportionately Black and Latinx are less likely to be transferred to long-term care facilities or skilled nursing facilities after hospitalizations that include an ICU stay. These patients are more likely to be discharged to home. Black patients who are discharged to home are less likely than white patients to experience improved activities of daily living following critical illness. When they are discharged to skilled nursing facilities, Black and Latinx patients are more likely to go to poor performing facilities as reflected by higher readmission rates and reduced success with discharge into the community. If these already known disparities in the post-hospitalization period aren't addressed in the care continuum for patients with COVID-19, we can expect to see future data demonstrating tremendous inequities in COVID-related comorbidities and re rehabilitation outcomes alongside the already problematic mortality data. We as physical therapists should be thinking proactively about the roles that we can play in improving rehabilitation outcomes for patients recovering from COVID-19. Through this exploration of health equity issues facing us with COVID-19, I hope we walk away with the perspective that our already challenged health system has not responded well to the acute stressor of COVID-19, particularly on the health equity front. In 2001, the Institute of Medicine published Crossing the Quality Chasm, a new health system for the 21st century. And the intention of this publication was to make an urgent call for fundamental change in our healthcare system to close the quality gap. One of their key recommendations was that all healthcare organizations, professional groups, and private and public purchasers should pursue six aims. Specifically, healthcare should be safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, efficient, and equitable. In the past 20 years, we've made progress on the first five aims, but health equity has not been focused on in the same way as the others. The president of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, Derek Feely, has called equity the forgotten aim from this IOM report. He goes on to say that in the report, equity of care is the focus, but equity of care provision is not enough because it only focuses on the person when they are patient under our care. But if we want equity of outcomes, we have to focus on care delivery as well as the social determinants of health, which impact people when they're not under our direct supervision. 
As a result of this line of work, IHI put forward a framework designed to optimize health system performance, which has been termed the triple aim of healthcare. The three aims are improving the experience of care for the patient, improving the health of populations, and reducing the per capita cost of healthcare. The six dimensions from crossing the quality chasm are key to improving the patient care experience, but addressing the social determinants of health at a system level is necessary to improve population health. We can't achieve the triple aim unless we tackle healthcare inequities across all three aims. In terms of cost reduction, it's important to highlight some data that shows the cost of healthcare inequities in our system using data from the Medical Expenditure Panel Survey. Leviste and colleagues estimated that an excess of $230 billion was spent in direct medical costs over a three-year period of time due to racial and, health and ethnic health inequalities. They estimated that an excess of $1 trillion was spent in indirect medical costs related to illness and premature death over that same three-year period of time. So even if you don't care about healthcare disparities and unequal treatment from the perspective of altruism or social justice, the financial burden on the healthcare system is tremendous. And addressing this issue is one potential way to decrease costs. So we've discussed many of the inequities that exist and how they're impacting individuals and our society at large. The natural next question is, what are the pathways forward for our profession to address the issue of health inequities. I think the best place for us, for us to focus our effort is by closely examining and taking up the recommendations from the Institute of Medicine's report, Unequal Treatment, which was published about 20 years ago. There's no need to recreate the wheel here. The IOM used a systematic approach to explore this body of literature on healthcare disparities, to analyze the data, to draw conclusions, and to make recommendations. So I'll focus on some of the recommendations that we should be able to embrace within the physical therapy profession. The first recommendation from the IOM document that I wanna discuss is to promote consistency and equity of care through evidence-based guidelines. This recommendation is critical for us as physical therapists. For APTA's 22nd annual Mailey Lecture, my longtime friend and colleague, Dr. Tara Jo Manal from the University of Delaware gave an inspired lecture entitled, Strike While the Iron is Hot. And in that talk, she challenged the physical therapy profession to resolve the issue of unwarranted variation in practice if we want our profession to successfully move forward. She said that variability in our outcomes cannot continue to be influenced by our current lack of discipline in the application of established standardized patterns of care. You know, when I was a brand new therapist in the mid 90s, there was a lot of discussion about whether physical therapy was more of an art or a science. Many of you from my generation know what I'm talking about. Who knows, maybe this is still a topic of discussion. I wanna be clear though, physical therapy cannot be thought of as an art. Maybe paint by numbers, because at least that uses a systematic approach. Physical therapy can have artistic elements, but science must prevail here. I was an English major in college, so I have a deep appreciation for the arts, but artists create by tapping into their heart, feelings, emotions, and their own unique perspectives. That's what makes art special. But all those things also make art inherently biased. The job of the scientist is to focus on reducing bias so that we can increase the validity of findings through a systematic approach. If each clinician leads with their own emotions and unique perspectives when making clinical decisions, will automatically see disparate care being provided. If there are 100 therapists in the room, you could potentially end up with 100 different treatment approaches for the same condition. In very practical terms, if you need surgery, you wanna know that the anesthesiologist is using a systematic approach to sedate you, and that the surgeon is using a systematic approach to perform the procedure no artistic choices are desired in that scenario, and that should be the case in physical therapy practice also. By using evidence-based guidelines, we can dampen the noise and reduce bias in the care process. When we think about the care process, we often think about a very clean and linear process 
wherein patient provided input by way of their medical history and preferences merges with exam based findings to inform the clinical decision making process and intervention selection and hopefully this process leads to a positive patient outcome. However, the care process is much more complex when you consider all the other factors that can influence this process and add bias into the equation. So let's take a look at the care process as laid out in this figure from the IOM report on equal treatment and explore where bias can creep in and lead to care inequities. This entire process can be impacted by uncertainty in the clinical interaction between the patient and provider or by social, economic, and cultural influences in the greater healthcare environment. And then there's the influence of stereotyping, bias, and prejudice, all of which can influence the clinician's interpretation of data and selection of the intervention, thus leading to racially disparate clinical decisions. If we use standardized and evidence-based guidelines in the care process for all of our patients, we automatically improve equity of care delivery. In terms of using evidence in our practice, the best approach is to use clinical practice guidelines, which are summary documents that contain recommendations based on systematic review, critical analysis of the literature about a specific clinical question. In the realm of low back pain, which is my area of research, there are clinical practice guidelines but there's a clear data to suggest that clinicians are not following these guidelines. In a study by Fritz and colleagues, they explored whether adherence to guidelines recommending active versus passive approaches was associated with better patient outcomes and lower costs. Interestingly, the adherence rate was only 40.4%, but adherent care was associated with lower costs and greater improvement in pain and disability. The additional benefit is that the therapist who followed those evidence-based guidelines delivered similar care to all their patients, regardless of demographics. The Institute of Medicine's recommendation to promote consistency and equity of care through evidence-based guidelines is critical to addressing equity in the field of physical therapy. I'll end our discussion with the first recommendation with another quote from Tara Jo Manali's, Tara Jo Manal's Maley Lecture. We must stop looking to expand our scope and promote our ability to practice at the top of our license until we get our house in order to ensure that all patients are cared for at the highest level in every physical therapy setting with every provider. That's not just a physical therapy problem. Unwarranted variability of care is the focus of scrutiny in all areas of healthcare. The next recommendation is to increase underrepresented U.S. racial and ethnic minorities among health professions. The focus here is on workforce diversification, which is the missing link in reducing health inequities and the associated costs because it can have a direct impact on the provider and on the patient. For the provider, workforce diversification blunts the impact of prejudice, bias, and uncertainty in the clinical encounter through peer interactions amongst providers. For the patient, there's the opportunity to reduce feelings of isolation and medical mistrust when the patient can see themselves and other minority groups represented amongst the providers. Within the physical therapy profession, black, Latino, and indigenous populations are significantly underrepresented within the American Physical Therapy Association, amongst US PT faculty members, and amongst PT students nationally. Other healthcare disciplines have similar issues. About 15 years ago, medical educators began to focus on the lack of diversity in medical schools, and they turned their attention on their accreditation standards. The accreditation process, which is based on peer and self-assessment, is designed to improve academic quality and public accountability. To address the lack of diversity amongst medical students, the Liaison Committee on Medical Education, or LCME, which set standards for medical schools in North America, implemented a change in their written standards. These changes were designed to provoke action by all medical schools. They changed the language for standard MS-8 from each medical school should develop programs or partnerships aimed at broadening diversity to each medical school must develop programs. These changes seem to have had a direct impact on medical school matriculation as shown here. 
The shaded areas show the implementation period for these new LCME standards from 2009 to 2012. From 2002 to 2009, prior to implementation, the percentage of female and black matriculants decreased annually, while the percentage of Hispanic and Asian matriculants was increasing. After the implementation of these new standards, from 2012 to 2017, the annual trend in the percentage of female and black matriculants reversed, while the annual trend in the percentage of Hispanic matriculants continued to increase. Interestingly, we implemented a new program at the University of Delaware in 2012, which held similar principles as what was requested by the LCME standards. The program is called ADAPT, which stands for Advancing Diversity in Physical Therapy. While our core activities are all focused on making the student a strong candidate for graduate education, the best parts really come when relationships can truly be built with the student. I'd like to give you a brief vignette that was just written for our university publication about one of our former ADAPT students who is also a UDPT alum, a young black woman who is now thriving as a practicing physical therapist. Although she had two sisters who went to college, no one in her family had gone to graduate school. She didn't know what it would take academically or financially, especially after her mother died during her sophomore year. Working with Jeannie Warrington, the ADAPT academic program coordinator, she was able to secure a scholarship to help finish her undergraduate degree. From the first meeting she attended, being a part of ADAPT made her feel included. She remembered watching a presentation with images of black physical therapists on the screen. She remembers thinking, I feel like this is something I'm welcome to be a part of. It's not an exclusive club that I have to break my way into. It's like, no. Other people have done it before, and you can do this too. And I think that's the more intangible part that ADAPT offer me. In addition to her powerful testimony, I can also show you some data to support our ongoing work at UD. The ADAPT program started about three years into this 10-year window. And during this time period, we also had a significant increase in class size, which is why I'm showing the actual number of students as well as the percentage of the student body. So for the class of 2011, 5.8% of the class were from historically underrepresented minority groups in physical therapy. And for the class of 2021, 15.6% of the class were underrepresented. As you can see, our diversity has increased without any negative impact on the academic profile of our student body. In fact, GPAs have increased over time while GREs have stayed stable. As a profession, we have to make some big moves. So in that vein, one of my last actions as a member of the APTA Board of Directors was to put forth a recommendation to the board to petition CAPTI, our accrediting body, to augment current standards and required elements for accreditation of both PT and PT assistant education programs. Ultimately, the board requested that there should be standalone required elements focused on diversity with distinct evidence for compliance requirements that would demonstrate engagement in ongoing and systematic efforts to enhance diversity, equity, and inclusion within PT education. CAPTI was very open to these recommendations and has since commissioned a diversity, equity, and inclusion task force to explore these recommendations and other task force recommendations. So I'm hopeful that we will see progress on this front and that these actions will begin to diversify our workforce. The next recommendation is to integrate cross-cultural education into the training of current and future health professionals. This recommendation from the IOM report is based on several unique findings. First, unaddressed social cultural differences between patient and provider negatively influence communication and clinical decision making. Communication within the clinical encounter is directly influenced by implicit and explicit biases of the provider by any clinical uncertainty that the provider may have when interacting with underrepresented groups, and by any beliefs or stereotypes held by the provider about other groups. Work from Hoffman and her team in the area of pain and racial disparities underscores this issue. In this study, they asked over 200 white medical students and residents to rate the pain levels of both a white and a black patient in the context of two mock medical cases. Then they were asked to recommend pain treatments based on the level of pain they thought the patient was experiencing. 
Separately, they were asked the extent to which they endorsed various beliefs about biological differences between black and white people. For example, that blacks age more slowly than whites, or that the nerve endings of black people are less sensitive than white people, their blood coagulates more quickly than whites, skin is thicker than whites, all of which are false, by the way. They found that half of the sample endorsed at least one of these false beliefs about racial differences in biology. And those who endorsed these beliefs were more likely to report lower pain ratings for the black patient versus the white patient, and were less likely to make treatment recommendations for the black patient that aligned with the World Health Organization treatment guidelines as compared to the white patient. On a good note, the white medical students and residents who did not endorse these false beliefs didn't show the same bias. Should we assume that our physical therapy students would fare better in this experiment? We must recognize that we all have implicit biases related to groups that differ from us, and those differences are not only along racial and ethnic lines. The first step is to recognize that these biases exist. There are online tests available to help you understand your own implicit biases better. The implicit association test from Harvard is a good one to check out. I would urge folks to explore this for yourself and then take the next steps to address whatever comes forward for you. The next finding regarding cross-cultural education is that it offers promise as a tool to improve the healthcare professional's ability to provide care to diverse patient populations and to ultimately reduce healthcare inequities. The Institute of Medicine suggests that training should include modules documenting the existence of racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare, as well as the impact of social factors, cognitive factors, stereotyping, and bias on clinical decision making. Once factors are identified that may interfere with the positive patient provider interaction, there are approaches that can be taken to address these issues. For instance, Helen Reese and her colleagues demonstrated that a brief intervention grounded in the neurobiology of empathy significantly improved physician empathy as rated by patients, which translates to a better healthcare experience for the patient. If we, as the physical therapy profession, take up this call to fully integrate cross-cultural education into the training of current and future health professionals, both in our educational programs and in our clinical settings, we have an incredible opportunity to advance health equity in the field of rehabilitation. The final recommendation from the IOM that I'd like to discuss is supporting the use of community health workers. Some of you may not be familiar with what community health workers do, but they fulfill multiple roles within the healthcare landscape. They can facilitate community participation within the health system. They can serve as liaisons between patients and providers. They educate providers about community needs and the culture of the community. They contribute to continuity and coordination of care and help to increase the use of preventive and primary care services. It would also seem that there could be an opportunity for them to increase the use of rehabilitation care services if we were at that table. Kim and colleagues found that integration of community health workers into the healthcare system was linked with reduced emergency department visits, reduced hospitalizations, fewer hospital readmissions, and reduced nursing home placement. At this point, almost every community has some version of community health workers who can help our patients navigate the healthcare system and overcome the barriers that limit access for underrepresented and underserved groups. In alignment with this IOM recommendation, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has made the recommendation to adopt new vital signs that would allow us to screen for non-medical factors that influence health as a pathway to increasing health equity. As physical therapists, we're all very comfortable with thinking about clinical vital signs like blood pressure, or heart rate, or respiratory rate. But what they're doing is challenging us to think about how we might capture information about our patient's social determinants of health. These vital signs might include employment, education, health literacy, or housing insecurity. I know this has taken us out of our comfort zone, and if you're anything like me, your initial thought may be something like, what am I supposed to do with this information? I'm not a social worker. But as I explored this recommendation more and thought about some of the challenges that my 80 plus year old parents have faced in navigating the healthcare system, my comfort level increased 
because I realized that I don't have to be a social worker or a community health worker, but I could be a part of setting up systems to connect patients with resources. For example, if you have an older, frail patient who needs functional strength training, but you also know that there are very real food insecurity issues for this patient, wouldn't you want to be able to connect that patient to resources that could assist with the nutritional aspects of their problem so that you can be more effective in your work as a physical therapist? This is the type of effort that can truly build health equity for your patients. Here's an example of a social needs screening tool that can be utilized to assess your patient's needs. This tool comes from Health Leads, a national healthcare organization that focuses on helping clinicians screen for these non-medical vital signs and then connect patients to appropriate community resources to fulfill these needs. There are organizations out there that can insist with these non-medical vital signs that are identified. There's the Medical Legal Partnership, which integrates pro bono legal professionals into healthcare teams to assist with housing issues or harmful environmental issues that impede health for low income populations. There's also Medicare Transitions Program designed to prevent hospital readmissions by addressing determinants of health that often trigger unnecessary readmissions. And then there are state and local agencies, which can provide a host of resources to assist older adults with a variety of issues, including food and housing insecurity, as well as caregiver burnout and respite care. As physical therapists, we're not trained to address the social determinants of health that so strongly impact the health of people in our communities. Instead, our mission as a profession is to optimize human movement to improve the human experience. But if we want to see equitable health outcomes for all of our patients, then we need to build partnerships with other professionals and community-based organizations who can provide these much needed services to our patients. Early on in this lecture, I invoked the words of Maya Angelou, and I'm gonna do it again. Another of my favorite quotes from her is, if you don't like something, change it. If you can't change it, change your attitude. And in this realm of healthcare equity, I think we can all agree that there are a lot of things that we don't like. And we as physical therapists can play a significant role in leveling the playing field for our patients through our own personal actions. We've discussed some of those approaches to doing that today. There's a lot that we can truly change if we pick up this mantle and move forward with conviction. Now there are some things that at the system level, most of us as individuals will not be able to change in the near future, like income gaps, educational gaps, healthcare fragmentation. So this may require an attitude adjustment for us as individuals. In today's society, most people don't want to be labeled as political because the word has come to have negative connotations within our fractured society. When I say political, I'm not talking about whether you label yourself as Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, or Independent. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines politics as the activities, actions, and policies that are used to gain and hold power in government or to influence a government. When we think of being political, most of us think about the gaining and holding power part, which can lead to divisiveness. But what if we start to focus on the piece about utilizing activities, actions, and policies to influence government? This is where our attitude shift as physical therapists can come in. We have a professional organization, the American Physical Therapy Association, with a large component focused on advocacy. They're the leading voice of the profession with members of Congress, regulatory agencies, and commercial payers. And if we're members of the APTA, there are pathways for us to influence how our profession advocates for policy changes that improve health equity within the realm of rehabilitation. When you look at an issue like health equity and all the challenges that go along with achieving equity, it can be overwhelming. And sometimes when we get overwhelmed, as human beings, we freeze in place. I would ask you to fight against any feelings or urges that would allow you to stand on the sidelines related to this issue. This is not an issue that only government officials or physicians or healthcare payers must work to fix. We have our own issues within the professional physical therapy and we need to take action. We have an opportunity to be leaders in establishing equity 
for all of our patients. And I leave you with these final words. Promote equity and consistency of care through the use of evidence-based practice guidelines. Diversify the physical therapy workforce. Integrate cross-cultural education into the training of current and future health professionals. Screen for non-medical factors influencing the health of your patients and refer them to professionals with the capacity to help them address those issues. Now is the time to plant the tree of health equity and nurture it until it is fully grown. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Hicks, for that truly inspirational and thought-provoking lecture. Um, well, we do have a little token here. I don't know whether you can see it or not <laughs> uh, of our appreciation, and I will be packing this up and sending it to you in the mail, but we are so grateful that you joined us tonight. So now I'm going to go ahead and introduce our first panelist to share a few comments. Uh, this is Dr. Keisha M. Thomas. Uh, in August of last year, Dr. Thomas became the fourth dean of the UAB College of Arts and Sciences. Prior to joining the UAB team, she was Senior Associate Dean in the Franklin College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Georgia, where she began her career in 1993 as Professor of Industrial Organizational Psychology and African American Studies. Dr. Thomas is an expert in the psychology of workplace diversity. Her scholarship and institutional engagements focus on the issues of strategic diversity recruitment, supporting diversity in STEM workplaces, and understanding the career experiences of high potential women of color. She's widely published and has been funded for her search by a variety of agencies. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Thomas. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be back among my colleagues in the School of Health Professions. And I wanna first congratulate all of those who were recognized uh, this evening for your hard work and also welcome Dr. Hicks to campus in this virtual sense. So um, I greatly enjoyed uh, the lecture and found a lot of ways in which um, the comments really integrated with my own work as an organizational psychologist seeking to create more inclusive workplaces and organizations in particular. And so one of the areas that I thought I would like to focus my comments um, is on the need for greater multiculturalism within our training programs. Um, and that I think needs to become the basis of um, any training in, in which we're interacting with the public or seeking to serve clients um, or patients. And so I don't know a lot about physical therapy other than being a consumer of it once in a while, um, but I do know that like all of the medical professions, sometimes there is a, a difficult history underlying the, you know, the, the evolution of a discipline. And so if I were to think about how do we create more multiculturally competent physical therapists, um, of course, I would want to um, make sure that the curriculum integrated information about racial, gender, age, and sexuality differences and the presentation of symptoms and disease, but also, you know, as was mentioned, cross-cultural foundations of things like diet, exercise, other behaviors, but maybe even um, the indigenous roots of some of the practices, treatment modalities that might be present today, which aren't always visible for us because sometimes that's a part of the history that gets buried. Um, I also think just broadly in regards to medicine, um, and the ways in which um, enslaved Africans, for example, were the, you know, really um, test patients or clients for many of the you know, surgeries, treatments, practices uh, that have evolved over the years. And although, again, you know, these are difficult um, conversations to have in 2021, I think they sensitize all, all of us, perhaps, to a culture of uh, distrust 
and concern when you know minoritized groups are interacting with the medical pro profession in particular. I do want to call attention um, to some of the research that was alluded to during the presentation, such as you know the study of UVA medical students who um, had some very hard to believe stereotypes about African Americans and pain and the thickness of skin and, and how those um, stereotypes um, can subsequently impact the ways in which we listen to clients or patients and subsequently treat them. But I wanna take that um, discussion around pain one step further and talk about the experiences of black girls in particular. Um, surprisingly, the Georgetown Law Center has done some very interesting research around our kind of societal uh, perceptions of Black girls. And so um, about five or six years ago, they published a report called Girlhood Interrupted. And in that report, shared, they shared data in which they demonstrated that by the age of five, Black girls um, start to experience what's called adultification bias. And what that means is that they are perceived as less innocent, uh, less fragile, in need of less protection. And so I wonder, you know, what does that mean for Black women subsequently when they seek medical care, when they express issues of pain? You know, we don't believe that a five-year-old is in need of protection or care. How do we feel about a 35 or a 45-year-old? And in fact, I just looked and the Georgetown Law Center has a new report out that really um, talks about the manifestations of that adultification bias. So there's lots of things to pursue the intersectionality of people who have multiple marginalized identities and the ways in which we respond, well, first, how do we hear them and how do we respond to them? But I also think there's lots to be said about what do we do as accrediting agencies? So from a macro perspective, how do we build in these expectations of getting rid of health disparities through more equitable and multiculturally competent practices? And so I look forward to that conversation as the evening develops. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. I'd la now like to introduce Dr. Brandon Wolf. He's the Assistant Vice President of Campus and Community Engagement in the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. He uses his role to leverage the university's mission and commitment to DEI as a resource to foster greater academic discourse that leads to intentional community engagement particularly for historically underrepresented and marginalized communities. He does this through four focus areas, education, access, and success, climate and intergroup relations, research and scholarship, and community building. In addition to his work at UAB, Dr. Wolf maintains an active scholarship agenda on the topics of diversity leadership, educational and organizational socialization. Uh, he's an editor and manuscript reviewer for several journal journals and volunteers throughout the Birmingham community. He's a Birmingham native and a three-time graduate of Auburn University with a bachelor's degree in psychology, master's in adult education, and a PhD in higher education administration. With that, Dr. Wolf, it's yours. All right, thank you so much for having me. Um, um, I guess I'll talk a little bit about, um, one, I, I love the presentation that you just gave Dr. Hicks because it speaks to what we do here at UAB. And that is this, you know, this push for inclusive excellence and that in this work that we do, it's not on just the shoulders of the person who holds the, the VP for diversity position or for the Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion. This work is, um, one that is on the shoulders of the entire community. Um, this is work that we must all take part in sharing. Um, we're cultivating this culture of equity mindfulness 
um, where, you know, if you see something, you see there's an issue, um, what we want to do is just mainly give you the tools and the resources and the support to get involved and help us take part in creating and strengthening our greater community. So here at UAB, we do a lot of, um, first we look at the data, like what does, um, what is our story? What, what does the data say, say about us? And from there, we begin to use that data to start identifying equity gaps. And as we identify the equity gaps that are taking place on our campus, we then begin to, just like in your profession, start identifying actions that which we can measure to determine whether or not we're being effective in this work. So um, I mentioned earlier, this whole notion of inclusive excellence here at UAB, all the work that we're doing is guided by this inclusive excellence framework. Um, we've identified five key areas for us is our access to success. You know, we're constantly asking ourselves who gets to be invited to the table, who gets to be successful. So that's a question of recruitment, retention, just are they getting the tools and resources necessary to be successful in the work that they do or even matriculate, uh, whether it's students, faculty, or staff? Um, what does it mean to have a positive campus environment? Um, specifically, you know, we have an idea of how we want people to experience us, but then you also have what our students, our faculty, and all of our stakeholders, what they truly experience when they encounter us. So how do we close the gap to make sure that what we intend to provide is what people are feeling? So in other words, how do we ensure that we're creating a, a place where people can feel included, they can feel belonging, and they can um, feel supported in whatever role they decide to take up with our institution? Um, our diversity education. The one thing I love about what we do here at UAB is that the education and training we're providing is not always reactive to a response. Uh, the work that we do is very proactive. Again, we want people to be thinking on ways in which we can strengthen um, their, their own equity mindfulness and strengthen their own agency and supporting them in doing this work. Because again, everybody's a stakeholder in this community that we're building. Uh, our campus and community engagement. Uh, this is how we build and sustain relationships and nourish those relationships as we continue to advance this work across the entire enterprise and the surrounding communities. And last but not least, communication. Um, we have to tell our story better. We have to share our wins. We also have to uh, facilitate this level of um, radical vulnerability where we talk about some of our challenges. And I think well, as we are open about our challenges and open about some of our struggles and what we're doing to try to address some of those equity gaps, we leave the door open and we're constantly inviting people to the table. So while we're doing this work, we're consistently and continuously building capacity. Um, because again, everybody's a part of this story that we're building out that is UAB. Fantastic, thank you, Dr. Wolf. And um, you know, I had arranged this uh, discussion to talk a little bit about what's going on at the university level as Dr. Wolf just did, but I wanted to spend some time talking a little bit about what's happening at the School of Health Profession and the Department of Physical Therapy level. So I have to use slides. So I'm gonna pull up my slides quickly here. And um, I wanna first of all, talk about what's happening at the School of Health Professions building regarding some of these issues. And uh, while this has been an issue within the school for a while, our most uh, recent effort started in 1917, excuse me, 2017, when uh, our then D Dean Harold Jones uh, charged a task force to establish uh, some type of school-wide effort on DEI. Uh, five of it, four of us engaged in that and convened a new School of Health Professions Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Uh, that committee was pulled together in uh, January of 2018, and it was approved as a standing committee within the school in September of that year. But concurrently, several of us engaged in the National Inclusiveness Excellence Leadership Academy which is an academy that's designed to, to educate and prepare people to promote DEI in higher education. And that was a very uh, uh, fortunate uh, timing for launching this particular committee. 
these are the functions of the committee and I'm not gonna read them to you, but it does foster a lot of awareness and collaboration, looking at recruitment, retaining uh, diverse faculty, student and staff, and to um, promote discussion among the different units. Uh, during the first two years, we uh, decided to start out with a DEI assessment survey to all the uh, faculty, staff, and students. Uh, we had several launch events, and then we developed an inclusion awareness video. And just talking a little bit more about these, our DEI assessment survey was really set up to kind of model uh, what we were trying to uh, bring to the table and bring to the conversation. Uh, we used very culturally sensitive terminology. We tried to keep things very short and clear. And we wanted to establish a baseline so that several years down the road, we could look to see what kind of progress we had made. Uh, the launch events uh, were similar in that we wanted to uh, promote inclusiveness and try to get everyone together to talk about these issues. So they were really focused on what people believed were the challenges, barriers to optimal DEI within the school and what they thought the potential strategies for extend, expanding these efforts should be. Um, the launch events were very interactive. We held them for students, staff, and faculty and we tried to model diversity and inclusiveness within them. Uh, it, it was important to point out too that we also asked the different units to uh, share their successes. Uh, as Dr. Wolf was uh, suggesting, we do learn a lot from each other and there were some great things going on within the different, different departments. So we really wanted to highlight those and learn from them. These are some of the themes that emerge from those launch events. And I can tell you that the DEI committee pulls these out on a regular basis to see, are we uh, addressing the things that our constituents want us to, to address with regards to DEI? Uh, we also established this inclusiveness awareness video, which used individuals within the school and the question focused around, how does it feel? when you are included within the School of Health Professions. Uh, and that video is still on our committee website for anyone that wants to take a look. Then uh, in 2019, uh, another department chair, Christy uh, harris Lamac, was and I were charged with updating uh, the, this plan. And we were asked to look at what the committee had done so far and then to make recommendations with the committee as to how we should move forward. And let me just point out that we did this uh, with this book in mind, A Strategic Diversity Leadership by Damon uh, Williams, which is focused on uh, what should happen in higher education to promote these ideals. Uh, this is what he spoke about as uh, aspirations for an inclusive environment. And this is what he talked about as capabilities needed to achieve this inclusive excellence. We aligned some of the activities that were going on currently with the DEI committee and then to, uh, with the DEI committee uh, proposed recommendations for moving this forward within those capabilities framework. So my point with showing this is that we did follow a, a strategy uh, in moving forward with uh, uh, DEI within the School of Health Professions. Uh, these, and, and these are my estimates, uh, are some of the things that we accomplished uh, since that time, uh, despite the fact that we were in the midst of a pandemic. And then additional activities that we were uh, carried out uh, during the pandemic are including uh, discussions, continuing discussions virtually, of course. Uh, we had a We Are Here video to let the whole school know that uh, our committee was still active and looking at issues. Uh, we've launched some alumni education sessions that I'll talk a little bit more in, about in just a moment. And then we have uh, set up incentives to engage our faculty, students, and staff to engage in uh, the courses that are offered by our university, Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion. 
And then I just want to point out this kind of unique uh, element uh, with our school's wellness committee, we developed some celebration trails. So they highlighted some of the murals and uh, historical markers uh, around social injustice here in the Birmingham area, encouraging people to learn more about them and to visit uh, these areas. So this is also on our committee's website. We have uh, since done an Instagram takeover within the school, and we have uh, initiated Dean's Diversity Awards within the school. So um, we, these are our goals for uh, the coming year, and uh, they do include uh, installing an art display in the entrance of the School of Health Professions to symbolize the school's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, these are the, the courses that I was mentioned earlier that are uh, developed or, or put out by Dr. Wolf's office, the uh, Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And we have set up incentives for our faculty so that we can encourage faculty, staff, and students, so we can encourage as many of them to engage in these courses as possible. And then we just started, and this is important to say here in this, with this audience, we just started offering these same courses to our alumni within the School of Health Professions. Uh, and these are being taught by Michelle Allen, who's the uh, education coordinator for the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and two of our faculty members here within the School of Health Professions. So you can see that there's a lot going on at the school level that not only supports the entire school, but also supports the Department of Physical Therapy. So what about the Department of Physical Therapy? Well, uh, just to give you a little background, uh, there has been a strong desire to en enhance diversity in our educational program for, for many years. There have been several initiatives that have been attempted, and I will admit with somewhat limited success. In 2017, we had a renewed commitment to get very serious about enhancing diversity. And we brought this guy named Greg Hicks down uh, to UAB uh, to consult with us. Um, I, I think at that time, the conversation focused mainly around diversity. Uh, and very soon thereafter, we had uh, some improved recruitment uh, of students from underrepresented groups uh, in, uh, in to, to 2018. Uh, for example, that class had approximately 18% of the class uh, identifying as African American. Uh, prior to that, the class right before that, there were no students that identified as African American. Now, I'd like to claim responsibility for that, but I do think that that mainly came from our, our dean's office group, who does an amazing job uh, with outreach and recruitment to students from underrepresented groups. In more recent uh, times, uh, the issues of inclusion and equity have begun to emerge more prominently. And then the events of last year, uh, the social injustice that was highlighted, the health inequities that, that were highlighted, and the killing of George Floyd really enhanced our awareness and urgency of action within the department. So in June of 2020, uh, we established a task force that was charged to examine the UAB's department current operations and activities as they relate to DEI issues and to propose recommendations for strategies and activities to enhance these efforts and then an ongoing way of monitoring this. Uh, this uh, uh, committee was uh, fairly large. We had 27 participants that included students, alumni, faculty members, and staff members. And this group met uh, over a five-week period um, in, in five meetings. The recommendations were formalized into a report that were then given to the department's faculty and staff. Uh, we held a retreat in December of last year and identified priorities for the coming year, things that we really wanted to focus our in, in energies around. Uh, that included enhanced student recruitment efforts, uh, looking at our curriculum, 
promoting discussion of these ideas, uh, even outside of the curriculum, faculty and staff development and training, adopting best practices for recruitment, uh, when openings for faculty and staff positions came about, and then to establish scholarships for underrepresented student populations. So I'd like to elaborate on these just a little bit. Um, our uh, enhanced recruitment efforts include these things. Uh, this is the group I was talking about that's been very helpful in bringing more students from underrepresented groups to our, our program. That's the SHP Office of Student Recruitment, Engagement, and Success. And they continually uh, look for more opportunities to, to reach out to uh, some of these uh, students. We have uh, been lucky to participate in the Summer Health Professions Education Program for the last two years. This is a program that's funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, and targets uh, freshmen and sophomore uh, university students from underrepresented groups. They come to UAB for six weeks and uh, there have been uh, roughly 12 students in each cohort that have identified physical therapy as an area of interest for them. Our faculty has been involved in doing physiology and anatomy reviews for the entire cohort, but our students has, have also served as mentors for the students that are rep, uh, uh, identifying uh, physical therapy as an area of interest. We have already started to see the benefits of participating from this program by having these very highly qualified students from underrepresented groups apply to our program. We're joining forces with our OT department this summer uh, where we're gonna hold a two-day information academy uh, for students. Uh, particularly, we're gonna be targeting students from HBCUs in Alabama and beyond who have an interest in in physical therapy to let them know about our program and encourage them to apply to us. And with the help of Dr. Wolf, we hope to launch an ongoing dialogue with advisors at HBCUs within Alabama and outside of Alabama. Um, for, with regards to our DPT uh, curriculum, uh, we were hearing loud and clear from our uh, task force that we need to address these issues early in the educational program and often throughout the program, that we need to be very brave in exploring these topics, not shy away from them, and that it, they should be integrated into all of our coursework. Um, and then very importantly, particularly since our faculty lacks diversity, uh, that we need to bring in individuals who represent the lived experience of people from underrepresented groups. Uh, we have not fully done this curriculum review, but I'm already imagining that we're gonna be adding more related to topics like cultural competence, humility, social determinants of health, looking at racism, implicit bias, social justice, social responsibility, and the communication skills that are needed to have these difficult conversations. We also just recently launched um, uh, an activity outside of the classroom called DEI Dialogues. Uh, in these uh, sessions, uh, we're, we're holding them virtually. We're bringing in individuals with some type of expertise in DEI uh, in the physical therapy field. We held our first one last month where we invited Remy Anafada who is the president of the National Association of Black Physical Therapists to talk about why they established that group and some of her experiences uh, with that. It was a huge success and, and a very meaningful discussion. We have several DEI dialogues coming up. Uh, we have uh, Oscar Galarado, uh, who's on faculty at the University of Southern California, who's gonna talk about his experiences with outreach in the Hispanic community in Los Angeles. We have Carla Bell and Melissa Hoffman, who are leaders in PT Prowl, which is an organization that supports uh, physical therapists from the LGBTQ community and the patients that we serve who are from that community. And then we also have a session coming up with Karen Korb, Amelia O'Hare, and Carnesha Patton, who are all individuals with disability 
who are advocates for disability inclusion. And we hope to continue these sessions to keep these conversations going. It's our intention to create an area uh, in our website on DEI and post these conversations so that they can be available to everyone. <clears throat> and then finally, we have uh, sent in uh, an application recently to develop a graduate certificate degree in primary care physical therapy for underserved populations. Now the curriculum has already been developed and validated by experts within the, the field of physical therapy. And we intend to uh, offer this program mostly online to enhance accessibility to uh, individuals interested in, in, in engaging in it. We are targeting our current students in the DPT program to take the certificate degree along with uh, or concurrently with the DPT program, but we're also targeting licensed physical therapists. And for those DPT students that would be engaged in this, we're seeking partnerships to establish scholarships for these students as an incentive for engaging in this. We're hoping that this will have an influence on physical therapists' interests and skills uh, for meeting the needs of uh, these populations. And then I also want to announce that we are launching a UAB Physical Therapy Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Scholarship Fund. And we're working with our um, external relations office here in the School of Health Professions to get this information out to everyone so they know how to contribute to this particular fund. And I'd just like to finish my comments uh, with this picture of many of the the amazing leaders that we've had within our educational program here uh, at UAB. And I, I just want to point out that um, while we've been hitting these issues relatively hard in recent years, I believe that our efforts represent the values of, uh, for social responsibility and justice that all of these leaders have held for many years here at UAB. And knowing these individuals and knowing that this fits with their values gives me great confidence in moving forward with our efforts to promote DEI in physical therapy here at UAB. So with that, I am going to stop my slide share. And uh, I think we're ready to open this up for an open discussion. So let me remind our participants that uh, we would like for you to type your questions and comments into either the chat box or the Q&A section. Okay, Dr. Morris, I have our first question, which is, can you elaborate on the relevance of this topic for PT in Alabama specifically? And I'm happy to start that that conversation because we have been looking at that within uh, our department uh, quite a bit of late. Uh, and you know, one of the things I'd, I'd like to start with is just to point out that we have a significant workforce shortage in physical therapy in, in Alabama. And uh, if you look at the latest workforce data from the APTA, uh, Alabama is third from the bottom in terms of meeting the needs of uh, physical therapy, the physical therapy needs in, in the state. This is particularly true in the western border of Alabama and in the southeastern portion of Alabama. And along with that, I'd, I'd like to point out that every county in Alabama is underserved for primary health care. Uh, and as, as potential members, not every county, there are three counties that that that's not true as Jefferson, Mobile, and Montgomery. And I think that sometimes we're, we're um, kind of blinded to these needs when we live in, in these areas. But as, as members, potential members of the primary health care team, I think that bringing more physical therapists who are aware of these issues could have a tremendous impact on, on Alabama. And then just finally, uh, as Dr. Hicks was saying about the um, lack of diversity within the uh, physical therapy workforce. I think it's particularly stinging for us here in Alabama. 
because uh, if you look at Birmingham alone, uh, over 70% of the residents in the city of Birmingham uh, identify as Black. And uh, there's a huge discrepancy between our workforce and, and those individuals. And it's statewide. Uh, I believe we are uh, like the eighth largest population of uh, individuals who identify as Black um, in the country. So there's a huge disparity in particular uh, between the PT workforce and the Alabama citizens uh, that needs to be addressed. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Our next question um, is for um, all of the panelists and um, wondering about your thoughts on the terminology of multi slash cultural competence. Are we ever truly able to be competent in another person's culture or even our own? We know that a large amount of diversity and variability within a given culture. Does competency imply a checkbox approach? I love that question. And uh, thank you, Kate, for um, a really well thought out um, item. So when I use um, multicultural competence, I am certainly not thinking of an end state. Um, instead, I'm thinking of a growth mindset when it comes to not only understanding seeking to understand others, but also seeking to understand oneself. So if I had had more time, I would have talked more about identity development, uh, racial identity development, gender identity development as two examples. And that, you know, I believe in order to be a, a culturally competent practitioner, there has to be some level of dedication and commitment to know oneself. Uh, to kind of understand your own kind of history, how that shapes your identity, but also the responses to, of others to yourself, but also how you respond to others who, who may be different. So I often think, you know, there's, there's so much of a push to diversify classrooms. And I think, well, what does it matter if someone sits next to me who's of a different race or gender? How does that affect my learning? How does it you know, affect my experience? And honestly, it doesn't. It only becomes impactful when we have an opportunity to relate in an inclusive environment um, and you know, discuss the ways in which our backgrounds and perspectives might intersect. And there's a lot of really interesting research offered by counseling psychology about the intersection of cross-race dyads who are often differing in their own racial identities. So imagine a white therapist who may be relatively low in their racial identity development because what's the motivation to think about race? Who is attempting to treat a black adolescent who, who is in a predominantly white suburban high school and is you know, dealing with issues of exclusion and microaggressions. They go to that low racial identity white therapist and, you know, the person's like, oh, you know, this is just adolescent angst. You'll get through it. You'll grow out of it. And they don't really hear what that adolescent is bringing. And, the, and they're not really giving credence to perhaps a different or unique experience from um, their own. So, I think you're right. You know, the multicultural competent practitioner is someone who is self-aware, who's committed to the ongoing exploration and identity of their own kind of self, but also those of others and, and see this from a, a growth mindset that there is no kind of end state that we're reaching towards. Yeah, um, I like to add on to what Dr. Thomas has mentioned. Um, we have to get rid of this um, this cultural competency checkbox approach. Um, this journey of cultural humility is a lifelong journey. I've been doing this work for nearly 20 years, and I still don't know everything there is to know. But also, too, is because 
when we think about cultural competency in this traditional sense, it was based on this whole argument that uh, culture in itself was was uh, static. It's not. Culture is fluid. Um, you know, you can have all people of one race in the same room, one, on one particular agenda, and I guarantee you there's diversity amongst them, whether it's geographic location, whether it's, you know, frames of thought, whether it's political ideology, there's so much that encompasses that the, the lifespan of the human experience. So um, we got to throw out this whole idea of like, we can do our cultural competency training, check the box, we know everything that we know about Black people, Asian people, uh, trans individuals, and so forth. You have to continuously, um, I think, you know, I was always reminded, like, the more you know, the more you realize that you don't know. And I just being open to realizing that not only that, that you just don't know what you don't know. So you have to be open to the experience. So that, that as Dr. Thomas has mentioned, that cross-culture engagement and, and, and finding meaningfulness in that is where you start and where you should continue um, in, in your growth process. You know, I, I just wanted to add in, I really couldn't agree more with Drs. Thomas and Wolf. Um, you know, we talk to our PT students all the time about being lifelong learners and having that sort of a mindset. And I think this is just another space where you have to have that mindset. There's so much to know and understand. You know, I have friends from all sorts of backgrounds and races and, you know, we have conversations and I'm constantly learning things about people that have been around for 25 years and the same, the other direction. There's so much value in that. And I think when you have that open mindset, that's when you really do have the opportunity to keep growing. And when you recognize that there is more to learn, you open yourself up in those conversations with patients so that you don't start off with just the bias that you may have relative to a certain group. You realize that people are much more complicated than that. And there's so much more to individuals um, and you can't even break it down in just to what group they come from because there's so much individual variability within those groups. So I think it's really important conceptually to think about it as this ongoing process that has to happen. I, I appreciate uh, Kate for bringing that question up. So along those same lines, does the phrase cultural responsiveness better describe the goal or is there an even better term or phrase to use? Yeah, I'm fearful of just trying to encompass all of this into one term. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm okay with culturally, multiculturally competent, um, but I would add on responsiveness and humility um, as well. So I, I don't want us to take shortcuts and try to put all, package all of this into, into one term. Um, because I think we are growing, you know, 10 years ago, we were not talking about cultural humility, but I think we understand now how important it is. Um, but 50 years ago, we would have been talking about um, the role of ethnocentrism and derailing cross-racial relationships in these types of settings. Um, and perhaps, you know, what we've grown into is humility over time. Now, ethnocentrism is an inability to step out of one's own cultural frame of reference in a way that often marginalizes someone who is identified as different or the other. Um, that's still a very relevant um, term uh, to our world today, and I think really fits the foundation of the need to practice humility. Yeah, um, and to add on to that, I, I think that in relation to the question, cultural responsiveness isn't so much as the goal as it is the a, a, just a, a tactic, a strategy. Um, you know, you need to be, if we're going to do this work, I think, you know, I, I joke about this often, but I tell people that um, the DEI conversation or the DEI outcomes would not be solved with just 
adding more black and brown people in the room and then just stirring it up and just expecting something magical to happen. We have to be very intentional with our approach. So using cultural responsiveness as a tool is, you know, you're, you're being intentional in your approach and ensuring and, and, and facilitating those type of cross-cultural engagements, but also uh, helping individuals that are coming into these spaces, no matter where they are on the spectrum, understand that we're all here to be lifelong learners. And it's, it's that common ground of cultural humility that, you know, no matter how far you're along on the spectrum, there's still much for us to learn. And we're gonna continue to do this work together. Thank you. So the next question is, um, how do you achieve better equity between rich and poor? I think that's the million dollar question. <laughs> and uh, yet, I think that there are um, many avenues that can be explored to, to come to some of those solutions. And I think that the big problem is, is at least within physical therapy as I've observed it, very little effort has been put into really trying to solve that particular problem. Um, now I'm seeing this profession-wide as being a, a heightened area of need. Um, uh, I'm hearing conversations happening all over uh, with regards to this, but, but the, the answers are still somewhat elusive. Yeah, um, I agree. I think, you know, when we think about the wealth equity gap, um, just in itself, and then, you know, we throw it on as an additional layer with as, um, a level that determines access and outcomes as it relates to healthcare. There's so many factors that contribute to the wealth equity gap. You know, this is a question that's rooted in history. It is rooted in geographic location. It is rooted in educational outcomes. It's rooted in the level of access um, and the barriers that are put in place for, for various groups. So it's not just I wish I had a magic wand to say, oh, this is how we deal with, this is how we close the gap. No, we there's a lot to be done in terms of fully unpacking the issue and getting to the root of the problem because the root, um, the, 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 the poverty is really, I would say more so uh, a byproduct of a greater systemic issue. And a greater systemic issue is who gets power and who gets power enforced upon them and what structures have been set up to maintain those particular hierarchies that, in, that um, lead to determining who gets access to wealth and resources and certain privileges in our society. I'm really interested in hearing how Dr. Hicks uh, responds to this item because you know, on first pass, I see it as a very political, um, sort of item with a political strategy underneath it. Um, as a psychologist, I will say that, you know, achieving equity between rich and poor means to first um, not desire or not benefit from the inequity. So we have to be mindful that a large segment of the population may be perfectly satisfied with inequities and that they are perceived as being a byproduct of a just world, that people get what they deserve. Um, and that just world orientation is one that is actually a defensive response because if people get what they deserve, then I must be middle-class and healthy and safe because I deserve to be so. And so if we can acknowledge that there's a population of people who hold on to that just world belief, who have those defensive attributions, then there's no motivation to get rid of the inequities. So, you know, <laughs> there are no simple answers at all to this question. And to really solve this problem, it's gonna require system level change. 
Um, and I don't have the expertise to give an answer on what is the best way to do that. Um, but, you know, I tried to talk today in the lecture about things that we as physical therapists are um, targets for change for us, things that we can be doing that would move the needle. And, you know, this idea of um, unwarranted variation in practice, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about this over the past few years. Um, mostly from the perspective of just thinking about patient outcomes and costs associated with healthcare, but it fits so perfectly into this issue of health equity. The more we standardize our care practices, you really are going to tamp down a lot of the bias that comes into play if some systems are automated so that you're gathering the same information on all people and it's not left up to the personal thoughts of an individual. And I, you know, I don't want to turn this into, we just have robots doing physical therapy. That's not what I'm saying. Because there's a lot of, there are a lot of decision-making things that a physical therapist has to do. But some of our collection of data, if it were automated, people would look at that data and realize, oh, I didn't even think about this as a potential issue for this patient. Then that puts it on the radar for them to think, how could I help address this problem? You know, really thinking about this idea of community health workers and starting to, you know, look at different types of vital signs. That was a lot for me to process and think through as I was really putting this talk together. But I think it just makes so much sense that we start to try to capture that sort of data that gets after these social determinants of health, which, you know, wealth, gaps are one of the biggest social determinants of health. We're not going to fix that problem as physical therapists, but the more we recognize where the issues lie, the more we can help our patients get to the right places so that they have all the things that they need. Um, I think we've got to really, from that perspective, start small in terms of the ways that we're thinking about what we should do from a clinical perspective. But then I think on a larger scale level, the physical therapy community, you know, APTA is constantly advocating on the Hill. If we as a community of physical therapists start to say, look, this is an area where we have got to make an impact these are the places where we want to really push. I think we have the ability to make an impact. Our profession is on the smaller side. I think we could actually really be leaders at the forefront of looking at health equity change within our country, but it has to be something that we all decide we really value and want to pursue. Um, and in our physical therapy students at the University of Delaware, sounds like the same at a lot of, you know, what's going on at UAB they're really hungry to see these sorts of changes happen. So it gives me a lot of hope for where we're heading in the future that you know, next generations will do better than we have in considering these issues. This wasn't really something I thought a ton about until later in my career. Um, so that's really the best answer I can give at this point. I wish I had the answer, but Well, hearing uh, Dr. Hicks's remarks uh, kind of made me think of, of uh, another notion. Uh, you know, we, we here at UAB have been very interested in really enhancing the physical therapist role in prevention and wellness and health promotion. And one of the things we've often said about that is that physical therapists are kind of uniquely positioned to do that type of thing because we do spend so much time with our patients. We see our patients repeatedly we develop a very close trusting relationship. So it lends itself well to dealing with health, lifestyle issues, that type of thing. I think the same is true uh, for some of these other issues. I think that we're positioned to uh, identify and recognize some of these health inequities much better than a lot of other healthcare professionals. And we have opportunities to serve as consultants, as Dr. Hicks was talking about, or, or referral sources uh, to some of these uh, social programs that could be helpful. And, and I think that that's, that's a huge connector for resolving some of these issues.
So our next question is, how do we as physical therapists deal with uninsured populations? This is a big question. So is healthcare an individual right in the US and how do PTs advocate? Again, an, another tough uh, question to answer, but I do think that we need to be looking beyond our uh, traditional approaches to physical therapy, our traditional idea of a physical therapy clinic, uh, be looking more about our role as a, as a member of a community outreach team. Uh, there are all sorts of ways that I think physical therapists could benefit from that in, in terms of uh, taking advantage of federal grants that can support their activities. Um, you know, I think that uh, I've observed physical therapists who have been very successful in carving out a part of their uh, practice that involves pro bono care or and or uh, in community outreach. And that ends up coming back to support uh, their clinic in a variety of ways by making their clinic more visible, uh, driving more clients in to see them. Uh, so I think we just need to expand our perception or our view of what, what a clinic could be and think beyond the traditional clinic. Okay, so the next question, uh, it's very here and now. So Robin asks, what are some practical things we can do in the clinic tomorrow to cultivate an environment of inclusion for our patients? I guess I'll take a stab at it. Uh, um... My grandmother used to always tell me this. Um, people don't care what you know till they know that you care. Um, that is, it, no, no matter where we come from, no matter how much money we make, no matter what side of the spectrum we fall on in terms of frames of thought, um, we all uh, ask and demand in many instances uh, human dignity. So that's, that's the common ground to, to embrace the human experience and to let people know, um, you know, as, as I think about this field and your field is, is so important because people are coming to you with their, with their vulnerabilities, you know, with their pains, with their aches, things that they know about their bodies, things that they don't know about their bodies. And at that, at that most of their most vulnerable moments, they're looking for somebody that can relate to them, someone that can connect with them, someone that's going that they can trust as a partnership in, in terms of healthcare to to take your advice and, and follow um, your diagnosis and, and, and your support, but also have such a relationship that they can also trust you to be completely open and vulnerable about their truth. So when someone says, hey, you know what? I gotta be honest. You told me to stretch, I did not stretch. And that's why I'm back here today. You told me to take this. You told me to do these exercises. I did them for two days, doc. And then I just had a really lazy weekend. And then I tried to superset it on, on Wednesday and I'm back here. So, and I'm, I'm talking about myself cause I've done this many a times. So, um, I think that's where we start. You know, you have to be connected to people. And, and, and look there, that's when the conversation evolved and being open to their experiences and not do this work from a place where we're paternalistic, but do this work from a sense of true partnership. Oh, I agree wholeheartedly. I think regardless of the, the setting, that we're in, be it a classroom, a clinic, a relationship, we have to keep the question, am I communicating for dominance or for a relationship? 
I think sometimes when we are in positions as experts, like faculty, um, we sometimes lose our humanity and we fail to be strategically vulnerable in a, in a way that would help build a relationship, build community, build trust um, in a way that will help us, you know, serve our students, clients, and, and patients. And, and that's really critical. So I wholeheartedly agree. You know, I go back to the Maya Angelou quote that I that I gave at the very beginning of the lecture, and, and just that people remember how you make them feel. And communication is such a key. You know, I was through undergraduate, most of undergraduate, I was pre-med. I was biology and an English major. I mentioned that in the talk. But I did a pre-med observer program um, my junior year. And I realized that that was not what I thought it was going to be and started talking to a friend who was wanting to go to physical therapy school. And then I started pursuing, you know, volunteer hours in that setting. And I realized that was the sort of relationship that I wanted to have with a patient or a client. Um, I think it's at the heart of what we do as physical therapists. It's about building that relationship with the patient so that there's that trust and that coalition between you and the patient. When someone is really telling you what's going on with them, whether it's about their pain or you know, functional limitations, they know if you're listening to them and if you're really hearing them. Um, and when you get to that point where the patient really knows that they're being heard and you're bringing back to them, hey, we're gonna do this because this is gonna help you with your inability to do whatever. They realize, oh gosh, you really paid attention to me. Those goals are really focused on what it is that I want to change, not just on what you think my numbers should be. So I think that is what makes people start to feel included and want to be a part of the environment. You know, my aunt, um, she called me back early in the pandemic. She was going to physical therapy for, you know, for some balance issues. And she had a negative experience and she thought, I don't know if these, you know, if this therapist that I interacted with, I don't know if he had a problem with me because of my race. And I said, well, what do you, you know, why do you think that? So we talked about it a little bit and I don't know whether he had an issue with her race or not, but it was very clear that he did not listen to her and she did not feel heard by him. And so there was that disconnect. And I think if you go out of your way to make that connection with your patients, which we're all very capable of doing as physical therapists, I think that's where the sweet spot is in terms of making people feel included. When, when I uh, saw Robin's question, uh, the first thing that came to mind to me was to get the conversation going. And um, that I'm, I'm making it sound simple, it's not simple. <laughs> Uh, I can tell you within uh, our faculty, I think my faculty members would agree with me that we've done that successfully and then we have done that unsuccessfully. Um, it's having these conversations that are meaningful that you grow from can be very contentious, they can be very uh, sensitive and there needs to be ground rules set up uh, uh, so that everyone respects one another. And the other two things that I think are really important for um, these conversations is to have people from the lived experience. We're not a diverse uh, profession. Uh, so we, we need people to really help us understand what, what the issues are and how it feels to be uh, in the underrepresented group. And I, it, it's only been within the last year or two that I've even been aware of the concept of privilege and uh, that I was uh, uh, benefiting from that privilege. Uh, and I think it's, it's something we all need to explore deeply before we think that, that we can truly understand and impact uh, people who don't have those advantages. So I think that lots of conversations need to take place and, and they need to be done bravely and they need to be done with respect.
Our next question is, how can I learn more about DEI in healthcare and physical therapy? I uh, will probably um, uh, turn to Dr. Hicks for, for more details, but hearing him talk about the renewed uh, commitment of the APTA uh, to diversity, equity, inclusion, I'm seeing many more resources come from our, our national association um, on this issue. Uh, in fact, it's, it's coming pretty rapidly. Um, what I've seen also is uh, lots of Zoom conferences <laughs> addressing these issues coming from the APTA. Very well done, very thoughtful. Uh, so I encourage people to really troll through the um, APTA website and look for, for some of these resources to learn more. There are many out there, many more that I've had the opportunity to take advantage of. I like to um, make a recommendation, not any of my books. Um, the first is uh, Beverly Tatum's Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? It doesn't sound like it would be relevant, but I think um, it's a great example of very well-researched social science um, that demonstrates how our blind spots, privilege, lack of cultural hum humility and responsiveness can really derail relationships across you know, these various intersections of identity. And because she's focused on kids, at least initially, I think we all have an opportunity to kind of relate to the work, to, to think about our own childhood experiences and how we've developed, but also then revisit those through perhaps the experiences of our own kids. So um, I highly recommend it. It's just a very well-researched um, book. The second book I want to recommend um, as you know, a community of healthcare providers is um, Medical Apartheid. Um, I had the author um, visit UGA several years ago, and it's really um, eye-opening. Harriet Washington, who's actually a, um, more a journalist, wrote the book, but it's not only kind of the, the history of inequity and exploitation, uh, you know, from the time of enslaved Africans, it's also about how um, we as a society are still perpetuating some of those practices when we think about um, individuals who are imprisoned, for example, or other vulnerable populations for whom uh, we are engaging in both um, biological and social science research. So I really strongly recommend that book as well. So a couple of resources that I would recommend. One, you know, I talked about it a lot in um, my talk tonight is unequal treatment, which is the IOM report of the Institute of Medicine report from early 2000s, maybe 2001, 2002. Unfortunately, most of the material in it is still highly relevant today. Um, they do a really excellent job of digging deep into um, the issues of health equity, and inclusion within the healthcare sector, um, not necessarily specific to physical therapy because our body of literature is frankly abysmally small when it comes to healthcare disparities and health equity. We've got a lot of work to do on that front. So unequal treatment is a document that will give you a really good perspective. They really appraised the entire body of literature leading up until that time and did very careful appraisal of the data. So, um, that's an excellent resource. The other thing I would suggest to do um, is to actually do PubMed search and start to look at what literature is out there on healthcare disparities and physical therapy. You know, I mentioned that it's small, but there is literature out there. Um, and I think it's eye opening when you see the data from these studies to realize things that you might not even think about. Um, you know, there's a, a study from Mary Katani, who is an occupational therapist, and they looked at both occupational therapy and physical therapy services. 
Um, and they found that children who were non-Hispanic Black children were less likely to receive physical therapy services. And when they did receive it, they received significantly less than children who were white, who had the same condition. Those sorts of things just shouldn't be the case. Um, so I think when you start to explore that body of literature, you will really start to, I think it's eye-opening. Um, there's a book I recently completed, um, um, and in addition to what everyone else has mentioned, uh, it's this book by uh, Rasma Menachem called My Grandmother's Hands. And it's a book that talks about, and Rasma Menachem is a, a therapist, social worker, and he talks about um, how racialized trauma impacts our bodies and, um, and also other areas of our lives, as well as what can we do to start better facilitate this relationship with trauma and healing. You know, when we think about this work, especially in healthcare, because when you think about uh, health disparities, there's a history tied to that. There's a history of oppression. There's a, there's a history of eugenics and there's a natural distrust. You know, we're not far removed from the Tuskegee syphilis experiment or the study. And because of that, um, you know, I, I can even say my, my, my mom, uh, who's in her 60s, still has a healthy distrust of the hospital. Um, because she doesn't understand the conversation and the jargon that's taking place. But when you ask her, does she understand? She'll say, mm hmm, yes. And, 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 but, you know, and ultimately she doesn't, you know, because of that, she doesn't really take to treatment well. And she doesn't, and, and because of that, that continues to proliferate this ongoing um, health disparities. But this is a great book. Um, also because it talks about the, the newer research about how trauma is passed down genetically as well. So people are being triggered, being in spaces and not realizing why they're being triggered. And I think this is a way to help us all be a little more sensitive to our patient population, as well as this is, this is a great tool for our own journey and through culture humility. Um, the other book I will recommend, Dr. Thomas beat me to it. Um, so I will, as always, I'll say did all the everything that Dr. Thomas mentions. And um, other than that, I'll give you my, my, my cheat sheet as a researcher. If I find a great article, I go straight to the references and I start taking note of the references and who are they citing. If they're citing, if there's a name that continues to continue to pop up, start re reading that person's work um, because that's basically what we do in the field. It's an ongoing conversation. We're listening to the people who've said this work, who who started this conversation before us, and where our insertion is something new to the field that others may have not considered or expanding upon a point that someone else has made. You're all a part of the conversation, so you know. Be, be aggressive, um, don't be afraid to take risk. Um, one thing about this work is that we have to continue to be vulnerable and that vulnerability also means not being afraid to make mistakes and learn from them. So happy hunting. Well, I'm, I'm mindful of the time here. We have uh, exceeded the, the time that we had allotted, but I'd like to thank our panelists uh, and Dr. Hicks for uh, sharing their wisdom and experiences with us. Uh, I'd also like to thank Amanda for running uh, this program and uh, working us through. And then I'd like to thank you, all of you, all of you participants for spending your time with us tonight. And we look forward to next year's uh, Gospin Lecture and uh, everyone have a good evening.